Uh, we might as well get started. Uh, welcome to everyone who joined. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Erica Mixon. I'm the content marketing manager here at Bloomera. I'm joined by Mike Behrman, the director of security at Bloomera. Also, Matthew Warner, the CTO and co-founder of Bloomera, as well as Patrick Garrity, the VP of operations at Bloomera. And today we have a special guest, Maria Sanbu, who is the guild lead of public cloud at Tieto Every. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Great, thanks for having us. So today we're gonna to go over how to approach patching. I know that Microsoft released a patch for Print Nightmare. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily work for all situations. So we're going to be delving into that a bit, um, how to basically understand this patch, what you should do about it, and um, a lot more. So we'll get right into it. So let's just go over this print nightmare scenario high level a little bit because it's been a bit of a confusing ride. So there have been two CVEs that have been addressed um, for the most part, somewhat, <laughs> again, confusing. So there's been CVE 2021-1675. That was what we originally thought was print nightmare, but turns out that was a vulnerability in the printer driver. It was a different attack vendor and was apparently addressed by the June 2021 security update. But then we've got another vulnerability that I guess has now been dubbed print nightmare, which is the Windows print spooler remote code execution vulnerability. Anything that I'm missing there, you guys, or anyone want to jump in? I, I, I can start um, because that's a good summary, by the way, because like when, when, when we initially saw the vulnerability, we're still like, we saw a lot of the security research, we're still confused if this was uh, old or the new, or new vulnerability that was initially fixed. So we spent a couple of days figuring out if this was actually fixed in the uh, June updates, but then we saw afterwards that no, these were not fixed in the, so the security update that came out at the end of June. Exactly. And you know what? I forgot to launch our first poll, which is how is everyone's holiday weekend? <laughs> was it relaxing? Were you thinking about print nightmare the whole time? Hopefully everyone got to enjoy the holiday weekend a little bit, but I know this plus the Kasaya ransomware probably put a wrench into things for some people. Uh, Marius, how was your weekend? You, you're in Norway, right? So but you're on um, vacation. Everyone in Norway, Marius just told me, has what five weeks off for summer vacation. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so this, this, this. Well, this vulnerability came like just before summer holidays. So I was one of the few individuals, lucky individuals, that was on work. So like I had to uh, get a good understanding of what was actually going on and figure out, okay, well, what should we do in our environment, uh, seeing that this is something that affects all of, or most of our infrastructure essentially. So. Yeah, I, I, I slept like a baby the entire time. Okay. Good. Who else slept like a baby? Mike? You did? Good. Patrick? Nice. All right. Looks like we're doing okay then. Everyone everyone just ignored the vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're they're doing the it with the, with the ramifications this week. <laughs> Turn Twitter off. Uh, Power your phone off. Yeah. Uh, Some point you just gotta you just gotta be able to relax. Uh, and then delving into this explanation a little bit more, um, for those of you who don't know the background, there was 10 years ago an escalation of a privilege bug in Windows Print Spooler. It was using Stuxnet. Um, so basically, to make a long story short, this, is, this you know, print nightmare situation has been going on for a long time. Printers have always been causing issues, and this is probably not going to be the last print nightmare, unfortunately. Not until Microsoft replaces the, the entirety of the logic associated with print spooling, printing, DNS, anything else that is legacy within the OS at this point, most likely. So it looks like only one person <laughs> hates their life. So that's that's good. <laughs> Please reach out so we can help you. Uh, whoever, whoever that is. That's, that's, we're concerned for you, for sure. Yes, definitely. Um, and then, you know, understanding Microsoft's emergency, emergency patch, it's a, a little bit confusing. Who wants to jump in here and kind of break down what this patch means and what it does fix? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is a new patch that, that just came out over the, well, very recently coming out from Microsoft. It does not yet cover every OS. 
uh, it really only provides a few changes associated with where we were last week to where we are now based on what we're seeing. And, and you can see a screenshot from um, over here from, from the creator of Mimi Cats for, for those of you who have been uh, associated with the, the defense and offensive side where it doesn't seem to actually stop the attack. It doesn't actually fix print nightmare. It just puts a few roadblocks in the way for people attempting to exploit it. Uh, and it allows you to do print driver sign enforcement, which is, is helpful. However, based on the testing that we have seen, uh, it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, the enforcement associated with driver signing will log out, like you can capture logs for it, which is helpful. And uh, we'll talk more about logging and visibility moving forward. But the patch itself is really limited in how much it actually resolves the issue. Inherently, um, previous to this morning, it looked like it at least stopped the RCE, so the remote code execution, but it still allowed uh, people to escalate their permissions. However, as of this morning, we now know that there was just a simple change in place. Essentially, the patch made it so you couldn't load a DLL over like a slash slash share. What the creator of Mimicats realized is that you could just load it using the universal naming convention for driver and pass. So it completely bypassed Microsoft's change there to stop this RCE uh, remotely happening. So the patch will not protect you from RC or LP necessarily, depending on how it's being exploited. Uh, the recommendations you've seen coming out of the last few days are the same, generally speaking. Don't allow people to, to touch your stuff. Start shutting off remote uh, access, and we'll talk about that more moving forward. And one of the things that's not on here that we also just learned uh, is that this patch includes a flash removal kit. Uh, it will remove flash on anything that you install this on. So just an FYI, if you're one of the organizations that still uses Flash and Legacy because you have to for whatever reason, maybe use Flex or that kind of thing. This can be a damaging patch for you as well. I, I don't know why Microsoft included it, but I wanted to make sure I noted that, that this, this won't be a bad thing to install, but it won't solve all of your issues for you. There will be another patch, hopefully soon, that will actually patch out the entirety of this vulnerability. Um, and there are some risks that come with it. It requires a reboot. It does include a flash on installer that you'll have to make sure you avoid and a few other kind of oddities like that. And it's I think not on 2012 every, and 2016. I'm, I mean, you, so you can upgrade from 2012 to 2019 and still it doesn't help. Uh, sorry, it's my sarcasm. Or, or you could uh, migrate your apps to Linux. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit cynical today. But no, this is good, good advice as far as visibility into like there's some some value in doing so, right? But uh, quite quite limited, likely for a sophisticated attacker. Yeah, it's it's something that you'll want to talk with your change advisory board on. You'll want to sit down and have a conversation around what does this get for us versus what's the what's the give and take here? What what are we actually going to be patching out? Can we just apply mitigations? And we'll talk about those here in a second. Can we just apply mitigations that move us forward without needing to? put in a patch that may be something that is really gonna be a half measure until there's a full patch that gets implemented by Microsoft. Um, and of course, I think all of us would love Microsoft to be a bit more communicative on this. Um, it's been pretty much silence from them other than random pat patches dropping out or like this one where it's like, hey, you can do printer signing now. So you could you could do that, that'd be great. And then it doesn't actually work properly. So we're we're at a point, especially over the last year, where Microsoft's cert abilities seem to just be like dropping off. Uh, and it's really this odd silent patching that we're, we're seeing. So we're gonna hope that Microsoft is a bit more commutative and we should be seeing a new patch here, ideally in the next few days. Uh, I'm gonna hope that's why 2012 and 2016 are not yet out as well, that they're just gonna do a full roll up of everything. Uh, but it, it's definitely one of those, consider containment, consider your environment. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next slide, I think as well. Yeah, and I launched a poll asking, you know, are you going to wait for Microsoft to release a more comprehensive patch? As you can see, the poll results here, um, the majority of our participants aren't sure yet. So we'll talk about some ways that you can evaluate whether this patch is going to be right for you and evaluate whether you'll still be vulnerable after the patch. This is a handy um, guide to help you understand the patch and whether you are vulnerable or not. Um, anyone care to quickly explain this diagram, Mike? Sure, yeah, I mean, um, first of all, I just wanna say, not sure yet people uh, I identify with you. 
I appreciate you. I, I think I'm in the same boat. Um, <clears throat> the situation is so dynamic, clearly. Uh, this diagram has changed forms uh, the past few days as well. So really it starts, the core of the uh, vulnerability starts with the, the printer spooler service being accessible. Uh, when that's not running, uh, that app will to fight to disable the entire thing. However, um, many people have that on and disabling it is not a trivial decision for an organization too. It needs to be very surgically done and all, uh, all appropriate risks should be included in that analysis. Uh, from there, really, you have a number of other different sort of um, attendant variables, right? The ability to um, handle inbound remote printing, uh, access mode, the point and print, which is a very common thing. That is actually different than the remote printing. There are different points in the registry. Both are found below in sections two and three, those notes down there, as well as the UIC. There's a lot of steps to do. This is gonna be really interesting to see how Microsoft tries to untangle this knot um, with so many different sort of related but independent pieces of software um, at work here. Absolutely. And something that you talked about, Mike, is just the importance of assessing your exposure, yeah. you know, because you were mentioning earlier, patching isn't necessarily an easy process, right? So it doesn't necessarily make sense for everyone to just blindly patch. Can someone talk to how exactly to assess your exposure and, and go from there? I'm happy to take this one if nobody minds that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I again, am, am of the uh, opinion there is no uh, one size fits all solution for this kind of scenario. Add to that um, changes, executing changes, getting approval for changes um, should be done very deliberately, very thoughtfully and with top level uh, supportive managers, usually through the change advisory process. But what we're talking about now is <clears throat> more or less an ad hoc patch. That's what Microsoft has made available. And while that's appreciated, that does handle some edge cases. It does pre present some measure of additional security as far as eliminating that attack surface. It is by no means the final solution. And so really uh, administrators, engineers responsible for this issue in their organization really need to look at how their operation, how their own organization works as far as ad hoc uh, change control goes whether it's worth waiting a few days to hit the whole kit and caboodle rather than just uh, Windows 10 clients and some 2019 servers. Um, do what's best for you. Think the whole thing through. And in the meantime, take less risky steps related to assessing your exposure, right? Looking at who's in, in the uh, printer 80 group, that security group there. Those people have delegated admin privileges. Those are things worth examining. Um, understanding where you have the spooler service in your server infrastructure, and you may not have realized it, understand what that looks like as well. Um, check, with your AD, check with your AD admin though. Um, the best friend of a security engineer in any organization is the AD admin, right? You guys should, you should be buying that man bourbon on a regular basis more than likely because you're gonna be calling in favors all the time in a Windows environment. Um, but understand what your exposure is in the organization. Take those kinds of things into account. Look at your patching process and make sure um, when you do act, it's both decisively and comprehensively. Or if the, if the environment is a little bit more risk tolerant and there's the expectation that we patch within 24 hours, roll that way. But make sure you are aligned with your organization at the end of the day. Absolutely. And Marius, you made a, a great point earlier is that a lot, of, um, a lot of the people that you're working with are using third-party print management vendors. Can you talk to that a little bit and, and what you should do if you're in that situation? Yeah, sure. So like I specialize a lot in end-user computing and, and Citrix environments in particular, and like in, in those environments, it's typical to use like third-party print services or like virtual print drivers. Uh, it's, it's important that you reach out to those third party uh, providers and ask them if, okay, but because some of them actually replace the print spooler and use their own type of print service of having a specific agent installed. 
Uh, so in that sense, you're not vulnerable to the same same extent, but if you're only using like a print driver, uh, then it will still be applicable with this vulnerability. Yeah, that's a great point to check all your boxes and make sure you're not vulnerable. Thank you for, for adding that. Um, and then here's another tip to assess your exposure of uh, your network infrastructure. Matt, do you wanna talk to this a little bit and explain what's going on in this slide? Sure. And I'll, I'll post this in the chat as well for everyone so you don't have to try to write down a long PowerShell WI command on the fly, because uh, that would be crazy. So one of the things that, of course, we, we've talked about is identifying uh, where Spooler is running. And really, for a lot of organizations, Spooler is enabled by default. It just is the inevitability of, of um, DCs and the way when you're setting up your environment. So in many cases, you'll have spooler exposure that is not necessarily required in the environment. And what this command will give you is uh, it will pull out the stats of jobs being run against those machines on the spooler to determine if there's anything actually spooling on the environment. And this should give you some strong indications. You could sample over, let's say, 10, 15 minutes and see if you're seeing any jobs running across your spoolers. But it should give you some amount of confidence to look at saying, is it okay for me to shut off remote configure or remote connections into this machine? Is it okay for me to just flat out disable the spooler on this machine and start giving you more confidence around making these changes? Because realistically, spooler is probably not required across a lot of your critical infrastructure that aren't print servers. And if they are, it may just be one of those situations like you saw on the previous slide of assessing your environment, assessing your attack um, surface and determining do we have spoolers running or we don't need to run them? Are they actually running anything through the spooler? And if they're not, we're probably ready to at least start with the process of disabling remote connections into the spooler. And if there are no complaints, then moving into disabling the spooler service as a whole. However, I, I generally wouldn't recommend just disabling the spooler service outright without validating that that spooler is not being utilized, especially in situations where people are using the spooler to print PDFs, for example, and ship them back. That's a really common use case that kind of gets lost in the cloud of spool usage where you're, you might have the DC connected or one of your servers connected to a printer, but it's being used to actually spool and ship PDFs out. And in those situations, you can break that. And this will let you see all of the stats associated with how that spooler is being utilized and let you make a good decision around, am I going to damage my internal infrastructure and my internal business processes by disabling the spooler? Um, none, of, none of us, I think all of us in IT have experienced that situation where you're making that choice between risk and business process. It's always part of the decision when it comes to patching and disabling those services. And this starts to let you get in that direction of making informed decisions about my environment, knowing how it works. And really, it may also give you the ability to get a good view as to where spooling is being used across your environment, because this happened last year. It happened 10 years ago. It's going to happen next year, probably. And it'll probably happen 10 years from now, unless Microsoft rewrites the entirety of Spool, Spooler in the next, let's hope, few years. Um, Windows Server 2028 will come out, and maybe that one will have a new Spooler. You never know. Uh, Who's ported port to the cloud? Well, I mean, <laughs> don't, don't, don't tempt them. They will do that if they can. Uh, <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, got a, I, I got a question on that note, Matt. Um, what other services should people be considering that run by default? And this is this is a, a, a hardball I'm throwing at you because uh, we did not talk about this beforehand, but are there any other services that are enabled by default like this that in some cases yeah. would be beneficial to disable? That's a, that's a good and fair question. So the, the way that I would approach that, and I'm sure the, a number of us have uh, some thoughts on that, um, is probably going to be things that aren't necessarily on by default, but people tend to install them when they set up a DC, either because when they set up that DC, they were just kind of putting it out there. It might be the first DC or it might be one that grew over time like that. Well, we needed DNS on the DC eight years ago. Uh, so we just installed it then, but now we're just moving forward and we just kept upgrading in place. And now it's a 2016 server. It was a 2012 R2, but it just kept bringing those services along. Things like that are where I really recommend kind of evaluating what services are running on it. And things like and DNS and DNS and services like that are going to be the ones that are going to be most risky, just generally speaking. But anything, this is going to sound really broad, uh, anything that is a legacy Windows service will inevitably come with some amount of risk associated with it. 
as we're seeing with the spooler, as we saw with Eternal Blue, as we've seen with anything associated with like older versions of SMB, older versions of DNS, uh, or just back supported versions of those things that will result in risk to these environments. It, it kind of reminds me like, especially for the smaller businesses, like how often have I seen the, the single server domain controller DNS? Oh, and it's a utility server. So you bring your, put your print servers in there and, and now you just start lobbing on additional software. Yep. And then what happens is, is like that business starts to grow and they become a larger business uh, and they still operate. Uh, I think ties to what you're talking about. Um, and so sometimes that's as you start scaling, right? Like maybe starting fresh, not fresh, but like spinning up a new domain controller and starting to segment and separate those services in a, in a zero trust type fashion uh, or more zero trusty, right? Uh, yes. yeah. would, would be the approach there, right? Marius linked a, a great link, which is very related to your question, which when you're, when you're using the desktop experience, especially, they will pile on services that just exist across Windows uh, because Microsoft loves to do that. Uh, and it is worth definitely validating things like, do you need Xbox off? You probably <laughs> don't, uh, and things like that. But those can all be rolled in. Do I think they're going to get exploited as often as the spooler? Probably not. They're a little newer, but can it easily happen? Definitely. Definitely can. But well, what if you're trying to game while you work, Matt? Well, if you're gaming on your, on, DCs, on your domain, <laughs> uh, I'm something sure has gone it's wrong at that. <laughs> sure it's bedtime. It's happened, I'm sure. But uh, please, think about the gamers, go. Matt. Please think about the gamers. I was I, I was reading a Reddit about someone asking about like, hey, all of a sudden I got BitLocker enabled and it locked these machines. This was this morning and. Basically, it was because they were logging into their personal accounts on the on the uh, device, and it was just like mind boggling. Like it's like, wow, this stuff shouldn't be happening, but it is. Um, so the the wild scenarios like that are uh, that do, do, certainly do happen, right? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's the natural evolution of Windows servers and Windows admins, and and that's kind of why I brought the Flash uninstaller with this patch, which is to say there's an inevitable kind of like evolution of windows servers when they have some amount of age to them where it's just like we've all gone through this you just keep adding either adding stuff to it you're adding new features to it you have new business requirements so you're building this up and it's really easy to accidentally break those pieces unless they're fully documented which as we all know is a whole other level of difficulty fully documented fully understood and it, it, it this may be one of those moments for hopefully all of us in it where it's kind of like well, maybe we should try to document where we are using these things at the very least, and then we can start to target them moving forward. Even just having a good documentation of like, these are the services running on my critical server infrastructure is likely a good way to move forward, generally speaking. Um, and uh, I know that um, we were talking about this earlier. One of the other areas that, that is interesting in regard to ex accessing your exposure is ensuring that your your normal users can't start the spooler. Um, we wanna make sure as we move forward that this doesn't become a, a area where attackers can just get user level access, turn on the spooler and then LPE that into admin system level access. So there, there's a number of layers that kind of come into this. How are you evaluating your exposure? A lot of it is where is your spooler running? Where is you have actually coverage? Who can actually access and start that spooler? And where is that spooler actually being used in the cases that it is actually running? So this really gets to that that really lame but oft mentioned uh, topic of cyber hygiene, right? And a lot of that really boils down to just being deliberate, being deliberate about what server services or what server roles and services are available in your critical infrastructure. Um, this is a great opportunity to sort of. Uh, take all the different stakeholders in your organization and, and take a look at this kind of thing. Um, the threats real. Uh, why not have the discussion right. Um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with know your exposure and do that homework. Right. If you bring that, if you bring that data to bear with those stakeholders, you're going to make a pretty strong case that um, you need to take action. You collectively need to come up with a plan of action. So. Absolutely. Thanks for adding that, Mike. Um, and you know, if the the Microsoft patch does make sense to implement, and you, and you do want to deploy that across the organization, you know, what are some best practices that people should keep in mind when doing that?
I mean, just like anything, I think it's really important to get uh, <clears throat> organizational leadership buy into a decision like this. Make sure you're aligned again with your existing security patch policy within the organization. Um, but then there are also smaller things that you can do, uh, taking a look at the point and print uh, system within the registry, seeing if that's critical for your business. Uh, that's a really important data point. Um, and then uh, as has been mentioned by Gentle Kiwi and Microsoft um, both, really uh, the driver signing for print, uh, print driver signing is helpful, no doubt, but kind of like Matt said, is that is, is print driver installation, should that really fall to any user or should that be an, an administrator activity only? And I think in most organizations, it's going to be the latter. Um, it doesn't mean take reckless uh, action to address that right away and um, to resolve it, but obviously follow your process, follow your, follow your leadership's guidance and uh, consider that as a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. And then can you explain, um, or someone else could explain this registry value, how, how to adjust that and, and what exactly that would do in regards to the, the patch? This is a bit of an, an addendum to the patch itself that Microsoft proffered. Um, there's a specific value associated with this key within the registry that can be enabled to work in combination with the driver signing that's been enabled. Right, and so it's an added protective measure uh, that helps reduce the number of, uh, it helps address the LPE piece a bit. Um, and it's probably healthy to do from a, from a cyber hygiene perspective. Again, assuming all those regular qualifications about being alignment with your organization policy and so forth. Absolutely, thanks Mike. And Marius, you work a lot with uh, companies that are operating VDI, that are running VDI. Is, are there any you know, differences in um, the best practices that they should be abiding by in your opinion? Well, the problem is that in most VDI environments where, uh, where a lot of users are accessing most of their line of business applications, it's, it's kind of a difficult decision to go and say, we're going to disable principal there. Uh, right. So, and, and then also there, and again, what Matt, Matt, Matt mentioned in terms of like risk versus uh, versus uh, the business, uh, we saw that, okay, we, we implement certain uh, monitoring policies so that we can see if someone's trying to abuse this specific vulnerability, uh, but still allow the principle to run because it's uh, something that's important for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the end users. So we're in some cases we're running with that specific risk because we, it's, it's still important to have that print option available. So yeah. um, and also we're also waiting for the uh, final update, uh, as we say, because like we don't want to do like a change advisory board now and implement a specific patch. And then we need to reboot all our systems, and then a couple of weeks uh, up ahead we get a new patch from Microsoft, and then we need to do the same. Uh, patch uh, patch around again. Mm -hmm. So um, we're still running in the meantime for certain workloads just with having the vulnerability in place, but having proper monitoring in place to make sure that no one's trying to abuse the vulnerability in the yeah. meantime. Yeah, it seems like there's a balance of, you know, the risk versus the business and then also maintaining your sanity as an administrator and a security <laughs> analyst as well, uh, making sure that you don't have to go through the through these redundant processes and deploy a patch over again when you know that you just deployed one maybe you know days or weeks prior right yeah. so let's talk about if you don't decide to apply the emergency patch that microsoft just released um, some best practices there you know we're we're talking about disable point and print does anyone want to talk to you know the the process of doing that I can give it a go. Sure. Cool. So in terms of like the point and print feature, that's essentially something that can be disabled using a group policy. It's under computer administrative templates and there's an option there on the print operation where you can disable a point and print feature. Um, also the other uh, mention, item mentions there in terms of, uh, because from our perspective, we look at specific event IDs, trying to look if someone's trying to 
uh, import an unsigned or assigned driver into the print spool or the print folder on the CA system drive. Um, now, by default, that's something that's not monitored by the, uh, the Windows event log, but it can be logged if you enable the print, uh, print service slash operational. It's not enabled by default. You need to go in and right click and enable it or use a PowerShell or CLI to enable that specific uh, log. And then we'll look at, at specific event IDs. One of them is um, one of them is 808, which looks into if someone tried to import an unsigned driver. And uh, the way this exploit is built, they try to import a DLL file, which essentially is trying to uh, look or mimic the print driver itself. Uh, we also look under the SMB client event ID. Uh, if someone's trying to use uh, SMB-based approach to import uh, DLL drivers from a specific SMB or UNC path. Um, the other approach, because that's just looking at the specific event IDs, you can also look at what's actually going on uh, within the specific folder of the principal itself. Can't remember the name of the folder, but uh, here you can use, for instance, Sysmon, which is an open source tool from, from Microsoft, uh, which can actually be used to monitor uh, the specific folder itself. And if something changes to the print folder itself, it can generate an event ID as well as part of Event Viewer. And that's the similar approach that we've been doing to actually monitor our VDI environments. Excellent. Thanks for that explanation. And I'm going to drop a link in the chat for some explanation on how to enable Sysmon. We have a, a wonderful guide on it on bluemera.com. Um, and by the way, all of those event, event IDs are monitored with Bluemera, right? We, we detect for those specific um, event IDs. Is that correct? They're, they're worth monitoring in and of themselves. They're probably too loud. They probably don't have the same fidelity we would look for in most of our threat detections, but they're definitely relevant from an investigative standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. um, the 808s, for instance, are seen in, in some of the failed exploit attempts <clears throat> for the same reason Marius mentioned. But yeah, they're, they're absolutely relevant for investigation. Hey, and one, one that your poll is timely uh, for the next slide, because I think like the question of, do you have the capability to monitor for these event IDs? If you do, it's great. You should go monitor for these things, right? If you're not sure, that probably means no, um, which means you probably don't have a uh, SIM in place or maybe you don't have the right login, Windows login. One thing just I want to encourage is like, if you don't have a system in place or know how to do these things, try Blue Mirror for free because we are essentially, you know, monitoring not only just these things, but you should in any uh, any environment be looking for different techniques and tactics because the reality is, is they might run this exploit, right? But pretty soon they're going to start moving within your environment and probably doing other things that could be easy, more easily detected, um, especially in a, a early stage uh, release of a CVE where there's not a working patch necessarily. So uh, I don't know if Mike or Matt, you want to comment on any of that uh, or Marius, but I, I think it is important for those that don't have detection capabilities in place for different techniques and tactics to, to uh, get something like Bloomer and it's, it's free to try. Yeah. Uh, so just want to highlight that. Detections really take a lot of different forms, especially with our, with our platform in particular. Um, you could have real-time monitoring for something. You could have something, uh, a report generated on an interval in just about any sim out there, including ours. And so that's where these event ideas, I think, are probably going to be the most appropriate. Have them run on a 24 by 7 basis. Examine that that output on a, uh, each time. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we specialize in developing for clients, right? We become their uh, threat detection response or sim experts. And that includes report generation. Thanks, Mike. We've got a question from an attendee um, asking, will Bloomera release an updated NX log for monitoring those additional event IDs? The current NX log on GitHub doesn't monitor the print service. Um, are we okay if we're just using Sysmon with Bloomera's recommended config? I believe the newest version of Flow Mira, which is the NX log comp file that we offer on GitHub, should have that print service operational channel available, right? So it should, these event IDs should be possible, but that's something we can go check in um, offline and, and verify. 
Yeah, in, in either case, the sysmon detection is looking for the actual DLL loading. So that's the actual exploitation of the vulnerability. I know that the print service operational will log out some information. We like sysmon only because of the fidelity of the detection. And we can get a little bit closer to the, the true source of, of vulnerability and exploitation that's going to happen there. But that super, super fair question. Awesome. And let's talk a little bit about um, Microsoft's recommendations. Um, and this this is regardless if you've deployed the patch or not. Is that correct? Anyone want to jump in there or? I, I can jump in seeing that the, well, Facebook, what we discussed with the current patch, we see that there's, there's still possible to exploit the vulnerability. So this is still the best set of recommendations for servers that do not require print spool, uh, do, do not require print spooling at all. Mm -hmm. So use the VMIC command and check through, okay, is there's any need for actual to use print spool or enable here in this server? If not, then please go in and disable the service so it's not actually possible to start at all. Um, and also that see, we also see that, uh, and this was uh, initially released a couple of days ago, and that okay, if you have, um, if you have the uh, built-in Windows firewall uh, rules in place, also the inbound remote printing, which is part of the, I think is part of the Windows firewall baseline. And if you also have that in place, it means that you are not able to use the RCE against the Windows 10 uh, computers that have the built-in firewall policy. Got it. Thank you, Marius. Appreciate that. And then uh, we've also got a recommendation for Blue Mirror customers as well. Is that correct? Yeah, this is just a SQL statement that we use for our existing production threat detection. Uh, really just looking for suspicious child processes of the spool service binary, right? Um, seeing things like run DLL32, PowerShell, CMD, those all could represent suspicious although albeit not necessarily guaranteed um, threats, right? Things that are worth examining though, things that you probably wanna be aware of in real time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, the, it seems like the theme here is that regardless of the patch or not, it's really important to be monitoring your, your infrastructure um, either way, because that makes, that ensures that you know what's going on in your environment and you have vis visibility there. And having a threat detection and response platform like Blumera allows you to do that. It basically is a replacement for a SOC. You don't, you don't need a SOC. Small IT teams can use it very easily and implement it very easily as well. Mike, I think you were just talking um, on our last live stream how one of our customers was able to deploy it in 30 minutes. Is that correct? More than one has, actually. But yeah, wow. the, the, rain, the reigning record is 30 minutes. And that was a minimum of three integrations. So integrations being the term we use for um, basically incorporating different disparate technologies, endpoint technologies, network technologies, and so forth. So it can it can take minutes, literally, and that's not entirely uncommon. Love that. Well, we encourage all of you, if you haven't signed up for a free trial for Bloomera to beat the record because we want to we want to see some people deployed <laughs> even quicker than that let's do it <laughs> records are made to be broken for sure exactly so just again uh feel free to try blue mirror for free at bluemirror.com slash trial um and we really appreciate you joining us on this live stream i think we provided some useful information and we answered some questions so we Hopefully we provided some insight to all of you attendees and, you know, it was great talking to, you, to everyone. Thank you so much. Hey, one, one other thing, um, cause a lot of people were asking them for slides and or, Hey, is there a recording YouTube? Uh, this is live streamed and then it will cut and publish almost immediately. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can rewatch anything we talked about as well, uh, to highlight there, but yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, everyone for joining. It's been fun. And Thanks, Marius. Marius as yeah, well. thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, happy to help. Hey, do you want to uh, maybe just tell everyone what you do and then what company you work for? Uh, so people are aware. I don't think we, we touched on that too much. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, That's no, okay. sure, sure, sure. So, so I work uh, in Norway. So I work for a service provider there called uh, Tieto Every. So I run a lot of the 
uh, cloud projects and technical initiatives that we do from a public cloud and security perspective. So I've been following this uh, quite, uh, well, following it quite heavily now the last last week or so, uh, trying to figure out uh, what kind of, how this actually affects us uh, and our infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and also an in interesting point of view is that to see that, I think this is just the first part of the first layer that we're going to be seeing from the print service or the principal layer and the vulnerability there. I'm guessing now that a lot of uh, security organizations will be focusing heavily on existing or legacy services in Windows and trying to find new vulnerabilities. And what I'll, what I'll also Mike mentioned, and I think this is a good starting point to take this discussion and building that security hygiene uh, before new vulnerabilities come up and then you are better prepared for handling this type of situation again when, when it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah I mean, I to totally agree. And Matt and I have been talking about this offline too. Uh, and this is speculation, right? This is just sort of uh, reading into the future a little bit. This is the kind of exploit that's probably going to hang around in an attacker's toolbox for a very long time because of the complexity behind patching, beca because people... Uh, many Every time you spin up a new server, it's yeah. enabled. All right. Yeah, this it's it's <laughs> gonna be it's gonna be a, a vulnerability worth checking for as a network intruder for a very long time, uh, especially in the absence of um, the ability to move laterally and escalate privileges through credentials and things like that. It's gonna be around for a long time, and so it's absolutely. This is not just um, a hot topic, in my opinion. This is something much much stronger. Uh, much more something with much more longevity. Um, it's worth having a conversation now, getting smart about doing the homework. Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. And just so you guys know, I um, also dropped in a link for Marius's um, blog post as well. He covered Print Nightmare really extensively um, on his blog, which is a really popular blog for end user computing topics. So everyone, feel free to check out that blog. Um, you know, as someone he, who used to edit Marius's work, he's a great writer and extremely comprehensive and thoughtful when it comes to um, blogging. So feel free to check out that blog and learn some new stuff. Thanks, everybody. It's been thank fun. You. Yeah, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone, so much. And thank you to the attendees for joining. We hope to yeah. see you soon.